Welcome into the Illini cast, and the Illini are not going bowling. It's kind of ironic, Sonny. I am recording this. Uh, had some business meetings out here in the state of Indiana, and ironically enough, I am staying in the city of Indianapolis as we speak. The week of the Big Ten Championship, something that I thought that Illinois would be playing in during the preseason, and they aren't even going bowling right now, Sonny. So welcome into the Atlanta cast, Austin Berkeley, Sonny Verma alongside me and Sonny. No bowling, no uh, no Big Ten Championship, just sadness. Uh, sadness all around. Uh, you know, we definitely expected the season to go uh, a slightly different way. And uh, to finish the season with five wins is, you know, not exactly what we wanted. But I think the sting of losing the type of game that we lost to our rival uh, on Saturday makes things a little bit worse. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's no way to sugarcoat it. You know, it's just a very somber mood uh, in Illini world right now. I mean, if you could capture the essence of the Illini football season, it might be within the confines of that 60 minutes of play in Northwestern where there was big-time flashes, but a lot of moments where you're like, we got to climb up this hill again, like, and again, and again, and... Then the officials came in and decided the game on on that two-point conversion there. Um, So pretty much Brett Bielema has been complaining about the referees the entire season. The refs kind of cost Illinois the game at the very end. Uh, Some big-time swings of momentum like there have been throughout the entire season, like losing to Nebraska, beating Minnesota, and then some just bad end-of-half situations like Aaron Henry's defense has come about uh, throughout the season all happened in this Northwestern game. And I could not be more upset with how this season has kind of went, but in the microcosm of this Northwestern game, it did not seem like it was in Illinois favor at all. This game. Yeah. I'm, I actually uh, tweeted that during the game. Um, what you just said, I was like, this game is, is everything this Illini football season has been. Um, we've, we're making progress. Our offense is doing things. And, you know, we're up 31-28. And uh, finally, we our defense finally has a three and out. And they punt it. And Isaiah Williams fumbles the ball. Northwestern gets the ball, comes back, and scores. The next play, our next series, same thing. It's a special teams error on uh, Wiltshire. Fumbles the ball, Northwestern scores. It's a... Uh, I guess that's kind of the best way to describe this team, at least the way I see it, is it's a team that's talented. It's a team that could win, but it can't help getting in its own way. And, you know, now, yeah, when we look back to that loss to Purdue and we look back to that non-performance against Nebraska and giving up an 18-point lead against Wisconsin, you know, this team may ultimately – just flat out deserve being a five win team. And, uh, you know, I mean, it it is what it is. It's just, you know, the the offense has kind of turned around from the beginning half of the season. I think we just, I just saw we finished fifth in the conference in offense and the defense, you know, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. It's like, I know we lost a couple players early in the game and our secondary was already pretty depleted, but it's, it, that was just a tough watch. Just, uh, you know, Northwestern hasn't scored that many points in a couple of years, I think I saw. And it's, you know, it's there's going to be a lot of questions. Uh, you know, there's a lot of meetings happening in the coach's room. And, you know, I'd love to be a fly on the wall for those. I mean, it didn't happen early on in the game, those special teams errors. But it was very reminis- reminiscent of that Purdue game where you lost the ball deep in your opponent's territory and it was easy for the other team to score. It was the scoop and score, I believe on, on one of them, I I think, but it was just like when Illinois had a chance this season, it just didn't take, take those opportunities and run with it. There was always that mental miscue. There was always that fumble. There was always that penalty and this season and in this Northwestern game, it it was kind of the amalgamation of all of that. And you kind of have to reap what you sow at some point. And that's kind of what Illinois had to do at the end of that Northwestern game. It's kind of ironic. Like, you know, obviously this Northwestern team, we all had 
dubbed to win two, maybe three games. But then I was watching, you know, the game on Saturday, and it's like that Northwestern team that I saw on the field is kind of the type of team I want for Illinois. And that's it wasn't supposed to be that way. It's a team that's a little under-talented, but they played like hell for their coach. You know, they limited their mistakes. And, you know, you know, all hats off to David Braun. He, you know, obviously he just won Big Ten Coach of the Year. And, you know, he fully well deserved it. You know, it's going to be an interesting offseason uh, moving forward with Braun. And I want to see how well he's going to recruit at this level, how well, you know, he's able to retain his coaching staff. You know, they're all Fitz's guys, uh, to my knowledge. But, uh, you know, when it comes to just a singular season, I think this is one of the most incredible jobs I've ever seen uh, in my years of watching uh, college football. And it's just a shame that, uh, you know, we were caught in it too. It's like, this is what I want us to aspire to be. And that's crazy to think about because we're in year three. And this was a guy who's handed a job by force who had never had a power five job before. So, I mean, that's the beauty and the whatever of sports, I guess. I mean, if you would have told me before the season that Illinois would have the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year for the first time since the year I was born, 1994, and you would have the only Big Ten West player on the first team offense in Isaiah Williams, I would have been like, all right, let's get the Rose Bowl cannons out right now. Let's let's go to Indianapolis. Let's do all of this. But football has proven itself to be a team game, and the offensive line has had its issues. The Defensive secondary has had their issues. Special teams, including that offensive first team player, has had some issues um, in just keeping the ball on the return team. And the guys that did their jobs uh, did their jobs pretty well, but there were also some guys that kind of struggled in the moment, uh, including in the Northwestern game. Yeah, it's like, you know, I love to see Isaiah Williams get that, you know, uh, passing touchdown to, uh, I forget who was the one who caught the ball, but I was uh, talking to my wife at the time who was just half paying attention with me. And I was like, you know, if this is Isaiah Williams' last game, there's kind of like a po- poetry to him getting a passing touchdown because that's what he had wanted to be uh, coming into Illinois uh, was a quarterback. And so I was really excited for him, really happy for him. And then <clears throat> not three, four minutes later, you know, he, he fumbles that, uh, that punt, uh, punt, attempted punt return. And, you know, that's just kind of like, it's just a trait of his, something he's like always needed to work on. Now, whether this is going to be his last game for the Illini, I don't know. Um, I haven't heard anything one way or the other, but I really hope that, you know, with all the money that's uh, being freed up, with Newton and Randolph uh, deciding that they're going to the next level, I hope we can convince him to stay one more year, basically break every Illinois wide receiver record that there is. And uh, because I I don't know, I haven't seen any mock drafts of him being drafted, or I'd imagine maybe he's like a late round pick because he's not exactly super fast. He's obviously not a big guy. And sometimes he has hands issues, as we can see on special teams. So yeah, you know, it's just uh, it, it's unfortunate for him. It's great for Casey Washington to have a send off game like that. It's like we were all always kind of waiting for that and to be able to have 200 yards. And that last well, uh, that last play where he, uh, you know, scored for a, to essentially attempt to try to tie the game was incredible. You know, one of the loudest screams I've had all season long. So, you know, it's it's. It's, I don't know. I, I Mixed feelings. You know, it's, it's mixed feelings about the game, mixed feelings about the season all around. I mean, at the end of the game, like, I think a lot of guys just start to look at their next chapter and don't even think about, like, coming back, especially after a game like that. So I, I think we got to let the dust, set, dust settle a little bit. Got to let uh, the right conversations to be had. Like, because, I mean, there was a point last year where Jerzon Newton was – clearly NFL bound and then he came back. So um, I I think that Isaiah Williams might be in that kind of mindset where he's like, oh, we were five and seven. I just want to think about my next move, like even though that might not be the best move. So I think the chips have to fall. And I think Icon is going to have a lot to say about what happens with Isaiah Williams. And I think Isaiah Williams has got to 
look himself in the mirror and say, am I really an NFL player right now? Are there things that I have to clear up? Yes, the stats were pretty sexy. I mean, being number two in receptions to Maserati Marv, as Gus Johnson likes to call Marvin Harrison Jr., I mean, that's a huge, huge thing for an Illinois receiver uh, to to happen. Like, I mean, last receiver we've had with that kind of skill is probably a really has been back in 2007. So I, I think that I say Williams just got to take his time. And I think I, I really think that he'll be back. I mean, you don't want to go into that undrafted wide receiver world. I mean, there's so many wide receivers coming up anyway. It's so easy to get lost in the shuffle. Like even if you're on a practice squad in an NFL locker room. So I think it would behoove him to come back for sure. But looking at this Northwestern game, I mean, Casey Washington, uh, he was phenomenal. I mean, he was on Mossed on Monday Night Countdown. I mean, when was the last time an Illinois receiver has been on that? I mean, there's been plenty of times that I'm sure an Illinois defensive back has been on Mossed, but the opposite end of the spectrum, the end that you don't want to be on getting Mossed. So, I mean, there was just so many positives in this game that I was just like hoping that Illinois could just – capture that last second momentum and make that two point conversion and send the game into overtime with all the momentum at home. But it clearly just was not in the cards for this Atlanta football team. And you kind of look back at the season. It's like missed opportunities. That's the name of the DVD of this Atlanta football season. I think. Yeah. You know, now it's time to just kind of focus, uh, heal up, you know, get Caden healthy, um, you know, just to kind of circle back on that, Isaiah Williams uh, conversation. I'm sure we're going to have a future episode um, looking more in depth about, you know, what our future roster looks like. But on just from a broad view, our offense actually looks like we're going to have a pretty solid offense uh, coming back next year. Our offensive line played better and better, you know, as the season progressed. Obviously, we'll have a, a redshirt junior year, Luke Altmeyer. Uh, Fagan, uh, Reggie Love. Uh, we've got a couple of young, you know, Khalil uh, Valentine, a four-star running back uh, in the running back room. Um, Malik Elzey has essentially announced that I think, I think that's what that uh, post uh, signified to me, that he's coming back next year. So, you know, we, if Isaiah Williams uh, slots into that wide receiver spot, we're going to have a pretty sound offense. And so, you know, as we talked about, you know, if someone's if uh, Isaiah is being uh, projected to be an undrafted free agent in the NFL, I would think that the opportunity to, you know, get some pretty good numbers, maybe a repeat uh, Big Ten all conference uh, award at the end of the season might be appealing to Isaiah. But, uh, you know, I mean, that's conversations I'm sure he's having having with his fa- uh, family, his coaches. You know, it's uh, he's got to go through the whole process first, but, you know, as a lot of players do, but, you know, it is what it is. I mean, Isaiah, you're going to want to listen to Corey Patterson, knowing that he was your high school coach, but he's going to be like, hey, NFL, go to the NFL. OK, like you don't need to stay in this Big Ten. No, no, no. It's going to get tougher. D- just go to the NFL. Like uh, you want to have great as great as stats. Go to the NFL. Remember, Corey's got his own issues. Did you see? He is the Purdue coach now, Isaiah. Just got to remember that. (laughs) Did you see how many players they've already lost in the transfer portal? Have you been paying attention? Oh, my gosh. Yes. I mean, they're going to have to reload like an entire offense at this point. I think their three best receivers are gone. I mean, that Ryan Walters first year, like, it was not great. Um, They obviously beat Illinois. But this is where you really get your coaching dollars here is that second year and that third year. That's when the challenges really start to become alarming because Jeff Brom didn't leave the cupboard that truly empty ish. Um, but now it's that cupboard is barren at the moment. And we'll see now how good of a real head coach uh, uh, Ryan Walters is. Can he develop players? You know, he, he's got a pretty good recruiting class coming in. They've got, you know, more four stars than they ever had in the Braum era. But now we're going to kind of see if Ryan Walters is just a defensive X's and O's guy or if he's really an all around head coach, uh, you know, in two years, like, are they going to be coming back and winning, you know, more than half their games or not? But it's going to be tough. You know, they, they, they as you said, they got a difficult re- a road ahead of them as well. I mean, the lumps of all of these Big Ten West teams, I know RIP Big Ten West after Saturday, 
But there's a lot of question marks on every single one of these Big Ten West programs with these four new teams coming in. And it's going to be fascinating to see. I mean, Minnesota, uh, Arthur uh, Calicomanis, he is transferring out of the out of the Minnesota Golden Gophers program after a five and seven year. Uh, Luke Fickle at Wisconsin. I mean, they were selling two dollar tickets at the end of their season. I mean, Nebraska. Matt Rule's talking about paying a $1.5 million for the best quarterback in NIL. Like, that's kind of what the going rate is, he's saying. Like, the question marks on all these Big Ten West teams, and there's no Big Ten West safety net anymore. It's going to be put up or shut up time for a lot of these coaches, including Brett Bielema at Illinois, because he has his own question marks to answer. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of holes to fill, um, you know, especially on the defensive side. I was kind of. Uh, um, relieved to hear in the press conference. I know, you know, you and I have our opinions on uh, Aaron Henry, uh, and it doesn't look like he's going anywhere. Obviously, I think the move would have been made already. But at least I was kind of relieved to hear Brett talk uh, about how him and the coaching staff may have to reevaluate um, the system and the players that they have in the locker room. And that, you know, after a couple seasons that maybe other teams have adjusted. And so that means that Brett sees that Illinois themselves may need to make some changes on their defensive schemes because, again, I know we were kind of under-talented in the secondary and we were young, but, you know, this season just went off the rails just because we couldn't stop anyone. And, you know, Barry Lunny, you know, I think we averaged like 405 yards the last five weeks of the season, something along those lines, and that includes a game against Iowa. So Barry Lunny, like he – turn things around offensively for us. But if we're giving up 45 points, if we're giving up 44 points a week, that's tough even for the best offensive coordinator in the country to overcome. Yeah, I I think we need some athletes at the linebacker position for Illinois because the lack of aggressiveness, the lack of sacks, the lack of pressure on any of these quarterbacks that Illinois has played this year outside of a guy by the name of Jerzon Newton, it's just been horrendous uh, by Aaron Henry. And I think it's a combination of X's and O's and Jimmy and Joe's. Um, And I think the system needs to change. I also think that recruiting wise, I think the transfer portal has got to be active on that defensive side of the ball. Um, You saw how thin the secondary was at the end of the Northwestern game. Uh, You've seen the lack of pressure outside of the law firm. I mean, it's just, um, it, it was hard to watch especially at the end of halves, whenever pressure kind of dictates everything. Um, I mean, I was watching the Eagles-Bills game. Everyone knows I'm a huge Eagles fan. When Buffalo decided we're not going to send pressure on Jalen Hurts at the end of the game in overtime, Jalen Hurts was able to carve up that Buffalo-Bills defense. And it was very similar to watching Aaron Henry's defense at the end of halves this year for Illinois, where there was no pressure, where it was all about letting the secondary do its thing. But whenever you have a inexperienced secondary, that's not going to go well for your defense, especially in an offensive power college football. So I, I think that some things have got to change, especially on the defensive side of the ball and getting pressure on the quarterbacks. I, I completely agree. Um, I am interested to see what Seth Coleman decides to do. I know um, the law firm has decided that they're going to, go to the NFL draft. And obviously, you know, that's probably the right decision. Um, Seth Coleman has got a decision to make. I do think if he can decide to be the focus point of the defensive line, um, you know, he can make himself a little bit more money uh, for next year's draft. Obviously we got, um, you know, we've had a pretty good recruiting week, surprisingly, um, since that loss in Northwestern. Um, one of the guys being um, the nation's top uh, junior college defensive lineman. Um, What's his name? Daniel Jones, I believe it was. Yep. He, he led the um, country in sacks with like 17 and a half sacks, I believe. So, you know, hopefully his skills and size can translate to something on the defensive line. Because, like you said, um, we're going to have a lot of holes to fill uh, on the defensive side. And, you know, I was reading an article and I just tweeted it out about how um, a certain person, like basically it seems like teams that have more transfer players on their roster tended to fare worse than the teams that were kind of home built. And I kind of figured that where it was the case. So on a big, 
you know, uh, macro level, Brett might have the right idea of saving some of that NIL money for uh, keeping guys in house and keeping the vibes good in the locker room. But I think we've, you and I have been talking about this all season long. We have to hope that Brett has seen the results of this season and realize that he needs to make some adjustments. Uh, you know, like it doesn't have to be filling up the entire defense with transfer portal players, but figure out where our obvious lack of talent is, figure out where we're not at Big Ten level yet, and, you know, pick and choose those spots, go get some legit good players, um, you know, build up that depth, uh, like you said, that we absolutely need to do. And, you know, just, you know, life is going to get a lot harder next year. And we're actually one of the lucky ones because our schedule is really not that bad. Uh, mm-hmm. compared to what it's going to look like the years after. So, you know, we got to maintain momentum. You know, we lost a significant uh, portion of it uh, this past season. But uh, I don't want to say it's lost yet, but if we, you know, win four games next year, uh, then all of a sudden, you know, questions are going to be asked about, you know, whether Brett's the, uh, the right guy. I mean, if you retain Seth Coleman, if you move Gabe Akis to that defensive line um, permanently next year, and – I think that'll help fill some of those holes that (laughs) Illinois had. And it's just all about adding that depth. Like Matthew Bailey went out and it just felt like the secondary lost all of its air out of the system. They're losing a one single guy in the secondary. So I think that is a huge, uh, a a huge issue. There is that whenever you have one injury that just derails everything. And I think that's kind of the separator between programs like Illinois and a program like Iowa and historically Wisconsin is that Wisconsin has like a great three star that they've developed pretty well. That's a second string that comes in and it's like the starter never left Illinois. When one starter goes down, it's like, Oh, we have a freshman. That's a three star. Haven't had a chance to develop him. Uh, so best of luck. We'll see what happens. And I think that's the next step for Illinois to get to as a program is just building depth upon depth upon depth. And that's the frustrating part where you just talked about how that's how uh, the Iowa's uh, tend to be, because that's what the national perception and our perception of what a Brett Bielema team is supposed to be. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for it to kind of fail so miserably this year, you know, eventually we found our running back. And then, you know, when he went down, you know, Reggie Love did have a good end of the season. And, you know, Aiden Lawfrey, you know, I'm excited to see what he has to offer next year. So offensively, like a, we can get back to that Brett Bielema ball um, of, you know, keeping the defense honest with a running game. Luke, Luke, I think, will get even better as a passer uh, next year because of the offensive line. You know, if we can plug a couple holes, um, you know, should be at least average as opposed to the abhorrent disaster it was at the beginning of this season but it's the mistakes you know it's like you know mistakes you what is it is it a coaching thing is it a player's thing that's what Brett's really got to figure out because we didn't play making mistakes is not a Brett Bielema team uh, trait and that's what we need to figure out uh, this offseason more than anything else because we're never going to be we're rarely going to be the more talented team on the field next year and moving forward uh in conference games. So the, the way for Illinois to win is going to be the one who doesn't make mistakes to capitalize on the other team's mistakes. I mean, and I'm pretty happy with the way that recruiting has gone recently, especially with Khalil Valentine. You can have a fire and ice with Caden Fegan in that running back room, a, a powerful runner in Caden, and then a guy that can swing at, swing it out, run to the outside, like Khalil Valentine. And then, Illinois got four-star offensive line transfer, Andrew Dennis, and not transfer, but re- high school recruit. I mean, the fact that you've got a guy like him who's going to enroll in January huge. Um, yeah. is huge. Yeah. It builds upon depth. Obviously, he's probably not going to be playing as a freshman unless something disastrous happens uh, as a starter. Um, but I, I, I think this is the way that Brett Bielema can build some things out, especially when you're – going up against the likes of Oregon and Washington, USC and UCLA, um, who are just building athletes upon athletes uh, in California. If Illinois can maintain that physical edge uh, with guys like Andrew Dennis, I mean, that's a game changer, uh, potentially, if you can uh, get other offensive line linemen just like Andrew Dennis. 
And sometimes it's just that one domino that needs to fall. You know, Andrew Dennis, he's the highest rated recruit we've had since uh, Marquez Beeson in what, 2019, I think, uh, 2019-ish. And, uh, you know, obviously we've been recruiting the offensive line pretty heavily over the last couple of seasons because, you know, as Brett made uh, it clear, you know, Lovey didn't leave us much uh, at that uh, at that position. So it'll be nice moving forward because we have some monsters. We have some guys who are six foot six, six foot eight, 350, 360. To be able to develop that along with having the high end talent like an Andrew Dennis, you know, may kickstart, you know, other guys out there. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you've seen, but Andrew Dennis, like he's already recruiting for us. You know, like uh, guys who have been in the transfer portal, he's, you know, retweeting, reposting, saying, hey, consider Illinois. What about Illinois? That's what you kind of want to see because. You know, we need our, you know, not that's the end all be all for their class ranking, but, you know, we just talked about Purdue having an awful season, yet they have like two or three times as many four stars as we do uh, in this upcoming class. And that's just one of those things where I think you and I both agree is that Brett needs to raise the talent level in that locker room because the talent coming in from four teams next year is going to be a big boost to the conference uh, overall, but Illinois is also in danger of just being left completely behind. Oh, absolutely. I mean, adding those four teams and with the lack of recruiting success that Brett Bielema has had uh, starting out, I mean, in the team talent ratings, they were like, what, 13th or 12th, um, according to 24-7, and the recruiting rankings, they've been hovering around – 10th or 11th. I mean, that's not the recipe for success. I know Brett Bielema is a master developer of talent. That's kind of his calling card, but you need to see it quickly. And if you're not doing it quickly, then that starts to raise doubts. And then that recruiting slips even further where you're not even getting one year transfers uh, because they want to go to a winning team, even if you have all the playing time to offer them. So this year is just crucial on how well can you develop your talent? And then that can potentially uh, help with getting talent being like, hey, if he's doing that to a three-star and I'm a four-star guy, what can he do to me? Uh, can he send me into a second round or a first round of the NFL draft? So this year is crucial to showcase what your strength is, and that's player development, and if you can actually do it at Illinois, and like, like you did at Wisconsin. Yeah, you're exactly right because uh, you know, especially Brett's style. You know, like, as you mentioned, you know, we're not going to get the four or five star recruits. So, you know, if we get the high end three star recruits, but if we have a four win season next year, well, Brett's not going to have time to develop to develop these guys because these you know high three star recruits like they take time to develop. Like, you have to wait till their junior years, their senior years, to become really good football players. Brett's, you know time window may not extend that long so you know if he's not bringing in the top talent guys now that shows just how important next year is going to be because um you know the college football world has changed you know illinois is going to have a big infuse of money coming in and uh you know you already see some guys you know which i think is ridiculous you know calling for brett bielham and the staff to be gone and to move on from them but uh i think for the better part most people agree to, you know, Brett, keep Brett. But next year, again, three, four wins on what's going to be our more favorable schedule compared to the two years following that. It's going to be tough. I mean, hypothetically, if Illinois struggles next year, do you trust Brett Bielema to hire a third offensive coordinator? I mean, Peterson didn't work. Lunny would not have worked in this hypothetical situation. Do you trust Brett to get that offensive coordinator position right and pair that with Aaron Henry on possibly making the bad decision on who you kept as defensive coordinator if you should have retained Kevin Kane or something like that? Like the possibilities are endless of how your coordinatorships did not go well if you're Brett Bielema. And then if you're Josh Whitman, you're like, uh, do I trust this guy to get it right on his staff? And then it opens up that whole can of worms. So next year, I cannot stress how important this that next season end is. 
But I also said the same thing about this season, and yet they still got the number one edge rusher from the JUCO ranks and a four-star offensive lineman right after a crushing loss like that to Northwestern. Yeah, I, it's, uh, you know, Barry Lenny's kind of, his seat has cooled off a little bit for me. I think he kind of showed me um, a lot over the last third of the season. So, and he's got a lot of offensive talent coming back next year. So I want to think, but maybe this is just the eternal optimist that I am, that maybe he, uh, Lenny was the right hire after all. We just had to figure out the whole offensive line situation. You know, obviously it's, it's easy to see that um, John Paddock is more of the type of quarterback that succeeds with uh, Barry Lenny's offense, someone who just makes quick decisions, whereas Altmaier takes a little bit longer. So, you know, we'll see what kind of coaching uh, Altmaier is uh, able to listen to over the offseason to see if he can kind of adapt Paddock's traits a little bit, you know, and, you know, the interview with John Paddock is, you know, was very high on Luke Altmaier saying, you know, he was just trying to learn. He was very supportive. He was, you know, still practicing his butt off uh, despite being demoted. But, you know, the way I look at it, it's not that Luke necessarily lost his job. I think, you know, Paddock just had an unreal end um, then he won it. It reminded me of, um, you just said you were born in 94, so you may, you may not remember, but like his run uh, in the Minnesota and Indiana games reminded me of uh, the St. Uh, I think, yeah, there were the St. Louis Rams at the time and their starting quarterback went down Trent green and they had this grocery store clerk come in and all of a sudden he was throwing bullets to these guys. And, you know, that ended up being Kurt Warner and just getting 400 yards almost seemingly every game. So I understand Brett's reasoning uh, to continue with John Paddock, but you also saw the flaws kind of, especially at the end of games where he's just so undersized, five foot 11. A lot of the, his throws were just getting batted down um, by the defensive line. But, you know, next year, hopefully we won't have that problem. You know, the, I I think it's going to be interesting to see if Brett brings in a transfer portal, like a veteran quarterback or not. I'm hoping, you know, at this point, the guys like Donovan Leary have been developing enough where, um, the coaching staff trusts them, but I think that's going to be something to kind of keep your eye on in the off season. Yeah. I mean, I can't wait to see the, the leaps that Luke Altmaier can do. Cause I know he's a great leader. I know he's a great worker. And I think the offensive line also did not give him any, any confidence at all early on in the year. I mean, you look at the Kansas game where he was just running around constantly and that's all that he was doing. So I, I do think that having an off continuity at offensive line and possibly getting better talent there can help Luke Altmaier out and possibly help him out uh, uh, toward the end of the year where he has the confidence to stand in the pocket and make some of those throws that Paddock was making at the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess, you know, we're going to have a lot more to talk about uh, over the next couple of weeks about what went right this season, what went wrong. Also, I'm curious, did you watch the, the game, uh, the Michigan uh, Ohio yeah. State game? Yes, I did. Um, and I was cheering for Ohio State because I don't cheer for cheaters. And um, I'll tell you what, that Michigan team, regardless of the sign stealing, is a very talented team and um I, I saw some tweets that were like, this game in the big current Big Ten is all about who's going to go to the college football playoff. Next year could be who's winning eight wins or nine wins. After seeing Michigan and how they are as a program, they are near the top of college football right now. I know Georgia and Alabama are always going to be one and two, but I think Michigan might have that third spot almost locked down at this point with Ohio State running this far behind at number four. I mean, it's just incredible to see that program in the Big Ten with the lack of athletes that are in the Midwest where they can just recruit anywhere in the country and including the South and steal some talent away from the likes of Georgia, Miami, Alabama. The list goes on. I'm actually looking forward to the games next year. You know, not ours necessarily, but, you know, Ohio State, they can run, they can pass, they can fly with Oregon and the Washingtons. Michigan obviously is more of the traditional Big Ten team. I think a matchup between like uh, a Michigan and Oregon, uh, if that happens sometime this year, will be a really interesting to see two different styles and dichotomies of uh, teams playing against each other. 
obviously Michigan next year is going to be reloading a bit. I saw that they had something like 17 uh, seniors on that team. So they're, you know, a senior laden team, but yeah, the way they've got that program humming, you know, uh, if Jim Harbaugh decides to leave for the NFL, you know, from where he had, you know, he was undefeated uh, and he beat their biggest rival. So it's like, I think they're probably just going to uh, hire him in house from what I've been uh, told by my Michigan friends. And uh, yeah, it's one of those where I didn't really have a rooting interest. Usually I root for Ohio state in that game, but I was kind of turned off by uh, Ohio's state Twitter in the sense how they were so insistent that the only reason that they lost the previous two years was because of uh, the cheating scandal. So there's a side of me who's kind of enjoying watching Ohio State Twitter just kind of crawl back with their tail between their legs and having to acknowledge that, no, that wasn't the only reason. Right now, as it is, Michigan is just the better program. I mean, if the refs spotted the football correctly four years ago, it might be a four-year stretch where Michigan wins over Ohio State. I mean, like, I know Ohio State fans won't be wanting to hear this, but sometimes rivalry games just go through stretches where a team wins five in a row, and it has no bearing on the talent of the opposite coach. I mean, Ryan Day is one hell of a coach. Like, again, probably solidified himself as the fourth best program in the entire country. I mean, he's undefeated against every other team not named Georgia and Michigan at this point in his career. And it's so ridiculous. some Ohio yeah. State fans want him gone. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like the Illinois Missouri game, like the arch rivalry basketball game. How many years have there been where how many stretches have there been where Missouri wins like six in a row and then Illinois wins eight in a row and then Missouri comes back and wins four in a row and these tides just happen for no apparent reason at all does not have anything to do with the talent on the actual field or court. It's just the way of the jungle sometimes. And right now, Ohio State is licking its wounds right um, with how this rivalry is shaped up. But. I mean, you're going to be in that 12-team playoff every single year if you're Ohio State coming up next, starting next year. So just be patient. That win will come. And even if it doesn't come, you can still win the national championship with this 12-team with this playoff. Yeah, and, you know, it's something we we're unfortunately going to have uh, an entire offseason starting today to discuss because we're not going to have a bowl game, but Hopefully we'll have, you know, continue to have more recruiting news and I know signing day is coming up and, you know, we'll keep everyone uh, updated on how Illinois is kind of doing with the transfer portal who are we're going to lose. I think what December 4th is the big day for that. Um, we'll find out if there's any defections, uh, people leaving or people coming in, uh, you know, should be an interesting, but it's going to be a very important uh, off season for Brett and uh, Illini football. Yeah, Brett's done a great job of talent retention, I'll tell you that much. Like, he has not had a lot of defections to the transfer portal, and so far that's continued. I mean, you haven't seen a rush of graphics made on Canva or Photoshop of a guy telling you that he's going to the transfer portal for Illinois, unlike Purdue. So, so far that Brett Bielema staple has uh, maintained, at least through the early onset of this transfer portal season. Yeah, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. December 4th, uh, you know, we'll probably uh, try to have a episode out uh, before then. But uh, if we hear anything before that, you know, we can always uh, get back on and discuss it. Absolutely, and we'll be also be talking to our big banter friends uh, throughout the offseason, especially might talk to Purdue uh, here about all of their defections and what the reasonings may be uh, in terms of their fan base. And uh, we'll cover Illinois to the best of our abilities uh, throughout this off season. So Sonny, it's been a great episode. I'm in Indianapolis, uh, but no big 10 championship for me. I'm not wearing my orange and blue going into Lucas oil on Saturday, unfortunately, but we'll trudge on possibly in the future. Probably not with Washington, Oregon and the other two coming in, but We'll get there. We'll get we'll get somewhere at least. Um, Sonny, it's been a great episode. Thank you, Austin. All right.